Good evening and welcome to the Hawaii Theater Center. You are joining for Tuning Up with... Wait, they're showing you first, Oh, Dave. sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> there was a big close-up of you, Dave. Okay, so I'm not Iggy, should, but... Should we start again? You okay. want to start again? Yes. You're Tuning Up, and I'm Iggy, and this is... I am I'm Dave. And uh, today is a, a great start. Uh, today, today is a holiday. Um, bet you didn't know about this one. Uh, I learned it this morning from uh, one of my wonderful colleagues, Steve. He came, he shouted over the wall. He said, hey, you know what? You know who I saw in the news this morning? Um, it's, it's, a, it's an international holiday. Um, today is International Ukulele Day. So in our advanced planning and all, <laughs> as we do here, uh, Iggy, can you introduce our guest? How, Not that how he... much advanced planning do we do? <laughs> we talked about this last week. Yeah, we, we did, we did actually. <laughs> uh, because for a guest such as tonight's guest, you do have to uh, plan ahead quite a bit. So we are so thrilled to welcome Jake. Shimabukuro, ukulele uh, extraordinaire. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. This is, yeah, this Our is uh, an honor. I was uh, just uh, telling Dave that actually, so Dave is an accomplished viola player, and the two of you have shared the stage already when I have yet to share the stage with Dave. <laughs> You're very lucky, Jake. <laughs> I know. Thank you. That was... Uh, you know, that was at the, at the Blue at Note, Blue we Note. did a virtual uh, benefit concert, and yeah. it was part of Joshua Nakazawa's uh, project, who was a guest on this show two weeks ago now. Just two weeks. See, we've actually been planning this for two weeks. Um, <laughs> yes, that was a really fun opportunity. We did Bohemian Rhapsody. Yes. Is, is the piece that I got to hop on for. Um, I've never heard it, that piece before. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to, and, and now for our off the main for, path, uh, for Iggy this evening, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was actually an, an arrangement uh, done by a friend of mine, um, Brian Shepard, out of Los Angeles, and uh, yeah, and so it was. It just it worked out perfectly. We already had parts yeah. for it, and um, yeah, and it's it's one of my favorites, and I, it's a. Uh, um, it was written by Freddie Mercury, who was the lead of singer of a band, right? Yes. Queen, and um, and uh, yeah, it's always just been one of my one of my f all time favorite classic rock tunes. Really? Oh, What's yeah. your second favorite? My second favorite, I I, I don't usually think about what oh. my second favorite is. <laughs> it's usually always always my favorite. favorite. But yeah, they are it's, just favorites. Right? Yeah, yeah, just favorites, just favorites. <laughs> I have to. I have to tell you, and I don't think we've we've ever talked about this before. The first time I heard you play was at Spoleto Festival in Charleston, South Carolina. Oh wow! I was, I was there for uh, the classical music festival. Yeah. Um, and I remember, you know, seeing the billboards of this. As at the time, it was the you know the ukulele concert because I was from Chicago and mm -hmm. I didn't know any better. Um, and I I came in with this you know perception of oh palm trees and and kind of this misguided idea of what i was going to hear that night and i think it was um my guitar gently weeps yes hearing you play that uh -huh. on the ukulele blew my mind and was one of those kind of defining moments in my life where it was like this is the potential when we think outside the bounds of what m music can be and should be and, and all of those mm. sorts of things and i i just it was outside in a park just have a very vivid memory of this, and uh, I'm, you know, can't believe I'm sitting next to you having this conversation. So. <laughs> no, that is a great festival, though. Yeah. yeah, I used to go there every other year, perform. It's a beautiful city, as yeah. you know, and yeah, well, that, that was, um, you know, that arrangement, uh, you know, it's a song written by George Harrison, of course, and I've always felt like such a strong connection to George Harrison because he loved the ukulele. Oh, really? You know, it was his favorite instrument. And he also lived in Hawaii part-time, right? He had a house on, he has a house on Maui. And um, so I just remember that, that, you know, I mean, all of his songs, to me anyway, the chord voicings, just the way the melody is laid out works so perfectly on the ukulele. And if, if he were alive today, I, I would have loved to have asked him if he got a lot of his melodic ideas from playing the ukulele, mm -hmm. you know, because they're, they're just, they work so well on that, on that instrument. Good. Yes, the harmonic changes mm -hmm. work beautifully. You know, what Dave said about his uh, 
introduction to the ukulele and maybe his, uh, you know, uh, judgment reminds me of, of something you said on a, on a TED Talk show, and you said the nice thing when you have a ukulele and you're about to perform anywhere in the world is that people have low expectations. <laughs> 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 that's that's always you know I, I say that all the time but it's it's so true right but it's like um, and I, I joke around about it but to me that's one of the that's one of the um, I don't know just one of the captivating things about mm -hmm. about the instrument or, or the charm of the instrument is you see this very simple it's it's a four string instrument but unlike the the violin or the viola um, because of the re-entrant tuning, which means that you know, uh, which which means that it's not like your normal string instrument where your highest string is closest to the ground and then your lowest string is you know is away from the ground. You start with a with an A, and then it drops to a, a an E, and then C, like middle C on a piano. But then when you get to the fourth string, it goes up a perfect fifth to a high G. So your two high strings are on the outside and your two low strings are in the middle so that is it's really amazing because you don't it's the only um string instrument that i know of well of course aside of the piano but it's the only string instrument where you have that major second mm -hmm. um interval in the open tuning and so because of that you can you know there's just so much that you can do with that yeah right so, so when you think of the ukulele, you think of kong 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 kong, or yeah. are you thinking kong 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 kong? No, no, I think yeah, it's kong, the, kong, the kong, way kong. we we would sing it as kids was to the phrase, "My dog has fleas," right? So <laughs> it's the da 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 da. But over the years, like modern modern players, you know, starting with people like Ota San and things have have also transitioned the tuning where they would make that that high G string an octave lower. So now you have a so now you have that low G, so it, it you know and it and it it has a very different sound the the way that if you listen to Israel Kamaka Vivole's version of Over the Rainbow right which is a very very famous uh, rendition of him strumming the ukulele and singing that the sound of that ukulele is with is tuned with a low G and that's why it has that very deep resonance to it. You, I, actually, my my wife. Um that is a version of that very beautiful. She'll, you know, turn red if I mention that. But uh, oh, I always on the, enjoy on the piano. No, on, on the oh, actual on the ukulele, ukulele oh, and then wow. she starts singing. It's always very, yeah. very beautiful. Uh, Dave, um, if people have questions, yes. what do they do? Well, they can text uh, in to us this evening uh, <laughs> right here at the bottom of our screen. This number right here, you can text. We'll see some of those questions as they're passed along to us, along with your name. Uh, and we can answer those on the air here. And I think we have a quiz question this we evening do. as well. I don't know if... Okay, so, well, <laughs> we do. Oh, uh, let me introduce that, that quiz question. Okay, because there's lead up. What Dave likes to ask the guest is, uh, he likes to ask the guest to take us from the beginning. Now, the beginning for me, in, in terms of knowing you, is when I joined the then Honolulu Symphony. It was back in 97. And I don't know if you came to perform in 97 and 98 around that time, mm -hmm. but uh, I remember vividly it was with your group called Pure Heart, my yes. friend. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and so that was kind of a revelation. Um, just the beautiful harmonies and the, just the, the, the be beautiful partnership you had with your friends and the, you know, the beautiful sounds, the percussion and the birds and, and the ukulele. Um, but I guess what, well, let's get to the quiz question, I guess, first, because I was <laughs> going to ask, ask something that might take too much time. But about this concert mm -hmm. is what our quiz question. So, uh, Jake, do you remember what we talked about, about yes. what that quiz question would be? Yeah. The, the, what was the first song, right, that, I, that, that well, with, with, with our group, we got to perform with the whole... Symphony Orchestra. You know, I don't know if it was actually the first song, but it was definitely one Oh, yeah, of well, yeah, for that show, yeah. Mm -hmm. Should we give uh, extra credit, or should we accept 
any of the songs, or are we looking for a piece that was specifically oh, for first Jake? instrumental song? Then how's that? Okay, it was the, the the first instrumental song. Great, yes, mm -hmm. specific is good. And we're talking about nineteen ninety. I think it was 99. 99. It was 1999, okay. yeah. 98 or 99. And yeah. um, our former Pops conductor, mm -hmm. Matt. Yeah, Matt Kattengoop, he did the arrangement for this. And, and I, remember, um, I remember one of the things that, that uh, was a little awkward for me for that first conversation was because I asked him, originally, the recording of, of, that, of that piece was in C-sharp minor. And the reason for that is because um, our, uh, John Yamasato, who was our singer, we t for that recording, we tuned, a half, we tuned all our instruments a half step down mm. so that it was easier for him to sing some of those songs. And well, he had to also sing the harmony for his songs. So for him to hit some of those notes, we tuned a half step down to kind of cheat a little yeah. bit, right? Brilliant. But a lot of, you know, Jimi Hendrix used to do yeah. it, right? The, a lot of the, you know, rock guitar players used to do it. So we did that. So when we did the arrangement for this song, um, Matt had arranged it. And then I told him, oh, no, because I was going to need to retune my instrument a half step down. So he said, he said, oh, well, what if I just... What if I just, you know, make all the parts a half step higher? It's like, you can do that? He goes, oh, yeah. I just... Uh, what? Click a button. Yeah, just with a click of a button. So I said, oh, okay, that's perfect. So, oh, that's yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. So, Dave, if uh, they get the right answer? Yes, well, if they get the right answer and they live locally here on Oahu, <laughs> uh, okay. we, <laughs> we have uh, a bottle of wine for you that we will deliver this week. Uh, it is an obsidian uh, Cabernet Sauvignon uh, from our good friend Terry at Hasser Wines here in Chinatown. And we have a lovely charcuterie Terry board, named after Terry, um, that uh, she has given us to enjoy here this evening. So the correct answer to the number on the bottom of your screen, and we look forward to seeing those. And I look forward to hearing what the answer is, because <laughs> I have... I have no idea. But it's good because it actually ties in. in good. Well, well, we can get to it's that It's all later. planned. So, but yeah. I guess the question I had... Um, oh, wait, wait. Shout out to Terry. Because I... Oh, hi, Terry, Pastor. if you're watching. Yeah, because uh, her brother and I went to high school together. Kamuki yes, High School. Kamuki, Kamuki High School. Mm. Very good. I used to take some late night Korean classes there. Oh, really? Yeah, for adults. Yeah, that's right. We ago. had the adult school there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Anyway, um, okay. Oh, I'm nervous. <laughs> so, I'm nervous. No, no, no. So, yeah. so this is not a serious class right now, but I did want to ask you because actually the first time I actually heard someone playing the ukulele live was that concert. But maybe can, can you just like tell us some of the people who inspired you to, mm. to, to play the ukulele? Who was there before you to... Yeah. to, to um, bring this instrument to light? Okay. Well, my, my biggest inspiration, you know, for playing the ukulele was Otasan. Otasan, uh, I mean, recorded, gosh, probably a hundred records, but he was, uh, he learned from Eddie Kamai, right, who was, who's regarded as the first ukulele virtuoso who paved the way for all of us. And, um, but Otasan, to me, was the most versatile you know he was just so diverse. i mean he was an incredible of course he played he his arrangements of a lot of traditional hawaiian songs were magical but he was an exceptional um jazz player i mean he could improvise over anything and his his chord voicings his technique was just incredible he could cross gen genres he would he would do beautiful um, arrangements of classical music. Um, he would take Japanese folk songs. You know, he he was one of the first guys that I know of that actually recorded with a full symphony orchestra. Mm -hmm. It was a song called "Song for Anna," and and you know, decades ago, uh, Andre Pop, you know, one of the the famous um, composers, heard Otasan play. And, 
and was just so mesmerized by his playing. And th this is the story that was told to me from, by uh, Otasan's son, Herbotha Jr. And was so mesmerized by his playing that he, he went up to Otasan after the show and said, you know, I'm going to write a piece piece for you and you're going to and I'm going to fly you up to Europe and we're going to record it together. And Otasan at the time was like, oh, yeah, sure, we'll see. And I guess a few months later or a year later, he contacted Otasan and said, I, I wrote this piece. I want you to fly up and, you know, let's record this. And they did this, this, this piece called Song for Anna, sold millions of copies worldwide. And uh, to me, it's, it's just one of the most gorgeous ukulele pieces, you know, ever written with full orchestra. And it's absolutely stunning to, to hear, to listen. I still have the vinyl, you know, at, at home. And is it something that you've had the opportunity to play with orchestra? Uh, no, never, yeah. Actually, I, that's, that's one song I, I, I never touch because to me really? it's Otasan's yeah. song. And the other thing with that song is, at the time, Otasan was playing with a low fourth string. So you can't actually play that song in the traditional tuning mm -hmm. with the re-entrant tuning. I mean, I mean, you can, but it just wouldn't sound exactly the same because you wouldn't have anything below middle C. Yeah. yeah. But it's cool. a beautiful, beautiful piece. If you haven't heard it, I, I, you definitely have to hear it. Yeah. Can I ask, we, we had a guest a couple weeks ago, Ron Artis II. Oh, and yeah. We, we did a, a little project with Ron. Uh, where he played with the symphony, and we were talking about the experience of playing with a symphony. Mm. It, it's much different than playing a solo show or playing with a your band, mm -hmm. to say. What's that like? Can you describe that? <laughs> it's, it's the sc scariest, most intimidating <laughs> feeling. Really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's... Um, and, and I love Ron. Ron is so talented. You know, I know uh, Josh Nakazawa was talking about him when he was on, and Josh said he's listening. So, Josh, if you're if you're listening, <laughs> but um, yeah, Ron is so incredibly talented. You know, I, I his his voice, his songwriting, you know, his guitar playing chops. I mean, he can play every instrument, um, but just so much music, right? Mm -hmm. Just comes out of him. But, but I, I, I will say that having the opportunity to play with a, with a symphony orchestra is the, it's the greatest honor if you're not, if you're not of the, the classical world. Um, you know, if, if you don't come from that, that, uh, you know, that, that world because you're on stage with, you know, at least 50 or 60 plus musicians who have dedicated their entire lives to playing this instrument and to have that many of them on stage together playing at the same time alongside of you is just, it's the, the greatest rush, you know? I mean, I, like people don't understand, like I, you know, I, I had the honor of playing with Maestro Iggy, you know, on many occasions and it was just, the the most um it was so fulfilling like for me and to and just just you know f for those of you that that are watching that that maybe um are not familiar with with the caliber of classical musicians um that i i want to share this story there was this one time we were going to play you know there was this this new piece that 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 we're gonna play, and I, I asked Iggy, because uh, it was a piece that I think, I, I, I wrote this guitar part for it, so I was gonna play the guitar part, and there was a, an ukulele solo somewhere in the, in the middle, and I remember telling you, Iggy, that, oh, shucks, I, I, you know, I, 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 wanted, I, wanted, I wanted something to, to at least play part of that melody, right, that the ukulele was playing. So Iggy said, "Oh yeah, let let me hear it, and I'll 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 play, you know, and I'll 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 jot it down and notate it." So I was like, "Okay." So I play the recording for him on my laptop. I was like, "Okay, here it is. It's coming up," and I was like, "Okay, it's coming up right here," and Iggy with his pen and paper listened to it, and in real time as it was playing, 
was just frantically like jotting down these notes. It was like a 16 bar solo. And then after that, it's, you know, I, I stopped it and he was like, he was like, is, is that the end? I said, yeah. And then he put in all the, all the, the yeah, measure lines, the measure. the measure lines and the, and he transcribed it in, in real time in perfectly. Well, and it was <laughs> like, just, it just, you know, again, it was just, uh, it's just amazing to, you know, the, 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 the time, the commitment, the dedication, the, the caliber, you know, musicianship that, that is required of the kind of music that you play every night. It's, um, I wish people could, I wish more people could understand and that you well, know I think I think a lot of people understand but what Jake is not saying is that someone else that a lot of people that I mean a lot of musicians that we played they wouldn't need to write everything down on a piece of paper they would just like do it right away on, on, on their instrument no but but <laughs> here's the thing we've had you know amazing artists uh, from the non-classical uh, field like yourself you know Amy Hanai Lee right here Helms and you all are so impressed by uh, the symphony, the orchestra, and the musicians. Uh, but what you should know, you and Raitea and Amy should know, and that we are equally impressed by your craft. So it takes many, many hours, hours of practice, you know, on the classical field. You know, we have to go to training, we start young, and you know, it takes a little bit of discipline and dedication. But, you know, I, and I'm sure some of you have read this book by uh, Malcolm Gladwell, I forgot the, title, but there's a chapter he talks about the Beatles and how they put in 10,000 hours of practice. And, and, and I'm sure that you've done at least 10,000 hours and you've done them really quickly early in, in your life. So I think it's, we all, all have this thing in common, which is just the passion and the dedication. And I know, um, you know, yourself, the first time you were maybe playing with the symphony, you were a little bit maybe maybe intimidating in, in, in a good way. I think you were kind of uh, humble, very humble, uh, just to see so much training that people like myself have had. But, but we've only had, we, I mean, we only, we trade all those things, classical music and, and, and solfege and theory and things like that. But, but what I'm very envious of is how you were able to learn so many different styles, Hawaiian music yourself, you, 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 know, you wrote some things that sounded very much like flamenco, jazz, blues, bluegrass. So I wanted to ask you, you know, early on, you, I'm sure, I, I, I think your mom taught you the first uh, few things on the, yeah. on the ukulele. How were you able to learn all the technique and the chords and, and playing single lines, melodic lines, but also like, did you have all kinds of music laying around at home? Because like you had Hawaiian music, you had jazz, and I mean, eventually you learn everything, right? So how, how did you find all those inspirations? Yeah, well, my, my um, you know, well, thank you for saying that, first of all, no, but, but it's still, true. You, I wouldn't say no, it, it wasn't you, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Yeah, I, I just loved all kinds of music growing up. You know, my, my mom and dad both had this incredible vinyl collection and just all day, you know, I mean, everything from like, like, uh, you know, from the Woodstock Festival to Olivia Newton-John to Vicky Carr to Otasan, Peter Moon Band, right? I mean, just, just, I mean, just all kinds of stuff. And back then, they didn't sit down with me and tell me what kind of, what style of music this was. You know, I just listened to all kinds of things, right? And I was just listening to whatever was played and uh, and a funny story about you know like the, the the Malcolm Gladwell book you know with the Beatles uh, so my dad had a Charlie Bird record who was a you know gifted guitar player played nylon string guitar mm. but did a lot of bossa nova and arrangements and things like that but he had a record where he covered a bunch of pop songs and on there were a whole bunch of Beatles songs so when I was a kid listening to this record, it was one of my favorite albums, and I guess it's because he played nylon string guitar. So the, the nylon string guitar really spoke to me because of the nylon strings of, of the ukulele. So I love listening to him. But I thought those were all his songs. So I thought, man, Charlie Bird writes some of the greatest melodies of all time. You know, so I didn't even know that, that 
those songs like Yesterday and Michelle and all that. I didn't know th those were written by the Beatles. I didn't even know those songs had lyrics because I was just hearing them as instrumentals. Um, but yeah, but I, I guess, you know, I, I grew up listening to a lot of different things, but then also I think what, what, what really um, I think inspired me was, was Bruce Lee. You know, Bruce Lee, I used to watch all of his movies. I used to watch his interviews and, and, and read some of his books. And, the, and, and I mean, there are so many things I can go into, but, but in a nutshell, you know, Bruce Lee embraced all the different styles of martial arts, right? Mm -hmm. Because he, he believed that every style of martial arts had something, uh, had, had something great about it and unique, right, to, to its tradition. So, I mean, he studied everything. And, I mean, even, like, Muhammad Ali's, like, footwork, you know, mm -hmm. like boxing. I mean, he just grappling everything. I mean, he was really the, the, the godfather of mixed martial arts. So when I, when I remember reading that as a kid, I thought, for some reason, I just looked at music and all these different styles of music as different styles of martial arts, mm. right? And then I, I realized that, you know, there, there's, there's something unique and, and, and amazing about each one of them. So then I started listening and just, just kind of taking the things that spoke to me. So if I, if I were listening to a bluegrass piece and maybe there's like a cool banjo roll or riff, I'd be like, oh, that's so cool. How can I incorporate that into the ukulele? Or if I hear uh, like a, a little riff on the harpsichord, you know, like some kind of uh, harmonic minor run, I'm like, oh, that's really cool. It catches my ear. You know, I love, I love that, you know, that sound. And I would figure out how to do it on, on the ukulele. So... It was just all these different things, you know. You mentioned blues and just kind of hearing those, uh, all those, those uh, signature uh -huh. sounds and characteristics, right, about each genre. Yeah. So you you embraced everything, Dave. I, I actually never asked you that question when you grew up. Uh, what did your parents uh, listen to, and what did you, you know? What your range of uh, genres? It was mostly classical music, if I are they, remember they correctly. Are they professors? No, they're not. They're not musicians. Uh, my mom's in the church choir. Um, you know that that sort of thing. Um, no, they. It was always you know WFMT was always on in the car, and it was a very rare occurrence that uh, classical music was not playing when we were driving someplace. Um, mm. At least that's what I remember. Um, but I'm I'm curious with the mixed martial arts, perhaps the most deadly. What, who were the composers that you were drawn to? Or are you drawn to now? Are there people who oh. stand out? Yeah, you know, compo it's, it's hard. It's, it's hard when you talk about composers because I, because it's, it's like, um, you know, because there, there, there are certain like, um, certain musicians that or artists i should say that will interpret a combination of notes mm -hmm. right in a way that um that i got to imagine even for the even for the the, the composer yeah it was like i could never imagine it sounding like that right i mean in I mean, like if you take like out of the you know if you go outside of uh, classical music world, if you take a song like Whitney Houston singing "I Will Always Love You," mm -hmm. right? Dolly Parton herself admitted that I never imagined that song sounding like that yeah. or becoming what it has become, right? Because it was another another artist who who took that melody who took you know, this, this piece and interpret it in a way that just, just spoke to so many people in a, in a, in an incredible way. So, yeah. So, I mean, for, for me, there's always been certain musicians that when I hear them play, it's just everything that, that, that they do to me, just like really, really yes. gets, gets under my skin, you know? Um, and, and, I just, uh, I don't know, like if, if I had to just name a, a, a few off, off the top of my head, you know, like, like when I hear, when I hear someone like Edgar Meyer mm. play, yeah. just, um, 
I remember one of the one of the first recordings I, I bought of Edgar Meyer. You know, I I, I listened to I, I listened to uh, what was the name of the the record? Appalachian? No, that's no, no. The, it was yeah. it was a um, gosh, what was it called? It wasn't his bluegrass. But anyways, I I was I I, tur I turned it on. And I'm listening to it. I'm just like oh. And I, I didn't I didn't read the inside yet, so I just wanted to listen. And I'm listening to it. I'm like, oh man, he's got a whole ensemble with him, <laughs> you know. So I thought he had like a little chamber, yeah. you know, orchestra or something. But then <laughs> later, I found out that that was him playing all those parts, yep. right? So to he, to imagine him playing up in that high register on the, on his double bass. It just like blows me away, right? But but anyways, you know, it's it's people, it's it's musicians like that, or like when I think of like the day, like Paganini, right? You know, I mean, you think of of Paganini, and 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 he was so virtuosic, but but also because he was writing these pieces, but he was performing them mm -hmm. in a way that just excited people and and just would like just electrify right the room yeah. so i think that's what that's what made it so so powerful so i think you know it's that combination of of the of the of the piece and the right person to interpret those yeah, i think those you, notes, you're you making know? a very good point because uh, actually I, I i i like to do tango and in tango it's very very important who whose style you're doing because you had a piece by a composer stampone but but then you have different tango orchestras, and they would do a piece very different from other orchestras. So you have Pugliese style, Lorenzi style, and so the performer um, takes a whole different new dimension. Um, you mentioned something about maybe you hear a chord on the harpsichord, which reminds me, I haven't checked with her, but you actually did take piano lesson with Ethel Iwasaki, <laughs> is that correct? Yeah. So, Eth hi, <laughs> Ethel. Oh, is she watching? Most likely. Oh, Ethel, hi. Yeah, you know, um, she was a huge, um, you know, it's, oh, she's an incredible teacher, of course, right? Um, but she was so influential. And I, I got to tell her this once, you know, I told her, you know, Ethel, thank you so much for, you know, for um, those lessons. And, you know, you were just so uh, influential in the way I approach music. And she looked at me, she goes, you know, what, what are you talking about, right? <laughs> but she never knew this all these years. There, and, and, I, and I'll never forget this because this was such an, such an ep epiphany for me. I was, I was having a lesson with Ethel and we're sitting, we're sitting there. I, I can't even remember what piece we're working on. But then we started talking about, about, rock and roll music and she goes I don't like rock and roll music so I said oh really so I said oh and I said why is that and she told me because there's no dynamics in rock and roll music it's just it's just one volume from beginning to end it's just you know and I and I remember walking out of that lesson just like I it was like it was I was just thinking about what she said and I realized like that dynamics is so important in, in any art form and then because it also made me realize that it's not just dynamics in, in volume right but dynamics can be applied to I mean harmonic dynamics mm -hmm. melodic dynamics you know the the, the uh, um, whether it's uh, going from one person playing to a hundred people playing at once. I mean, there's so many aspects and ways that you can apply dynamics, right, to, to any art form. So when I walked out of that lesson, a million things were going through my mind and I realized, oh my goodness, she's, she's so right. And I remember going home th that day, I took out my ukulele and I started trying to play the songs that I was playing already, but I started playing those songs and trying to add all this shape to it, you know? So whether it's, uh, so, you know, of course the basic, right? Going from pianissimo to, you know, what, what, you know, just loud to soft to loud and really working in those dynamics, but also going from playing a single line thing to a chord melody, 
right? So now I have this, this, one, this one line playing, but then now I got four voices at once. And I realized like that's, that's an incredible um, dynamic that I can use for the ukulele, right? Because I can play from really soft, just single notes, and then I can go to full chords and play, right? Um, uh, you know, tone color, going from using all of my, just, just all nail to all flesh on my finger. You know, and I can get these really wispy sounds, like if I just mm. use the side of my thumb on the strings and, and do this, almost like a, you know, like using it like a, like a bow, yeah. right, in a, in a way. And I started really um, exaggerating this. And I, and I thought that, you know, that's in, in, in life in general, that's what inspires us and excites us. It's dynamics. And colors, right? right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's because when, when things stay like this for too long of a time and it just becomes normal, it's like every once in a while we need this or we need this. <laughs> Right, to like, ooh, oh, whoa, that was, that was cool, you know? So, uh, yeah, so, um, so, yeah, Ethel, thank you so much because that, yeah, that completely changed my whole um, perspective, you know, on, in, in music. Dave, do I we have a, a winner yet? I don't believe we do. Oh, I'm no surprised. winner yet. We've had some good questions, though, if I may. Uh, Jake, if you were to study another instrument, what would it be from Mari? Oh. oh. Well, you've got the ukulele and you've got some piano already. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, you well, know, for, let me I, ask you, uh, do you play a guitar? Because I've seen you actually. I mean, I, I know a few chords on the guitar. If, if I work it out, I can learn it, but I'm, I'm not a guitar player. Yeah. I well, well, I've seen you perform on the guitar. I, I can play that one song. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I guess, um, I guess maybe, the, maybe the bass, you know, because that's to me, it's the it's the other half of my instrument, <laughs> you know, it's the, the, the sound that I don't have, but, uh, and that's why I love playing with, with bass players yeah. or, or even cellists, right? Like you mean, uh, you're talking about the bass or the, the bass guitar or the bass like? You know, either one. Okay. Yeah, I, either one, because uh, I think that that low register really helps to complete right, the ukulele. And I, I kind of have this theory because with the ukulele in, in the re-entrant tuning, Having the, the middle C as your lowest note, I feel like everything from middle C and, and above, your brain doesn't really categorize that as, as, as bass functioning tones. So on the ukulele, it's so, it's so much easier to play because you don't have to worry so much about bass resolution, mm. right? And like, you know, what, what's, what's happening uh, in, the, in the lower register. So you can play so freely and I think there's a lot of uh, this kind of, um, you know, I mean, everything is, can be so vague on the ukulele, right? Like I could play the open strings on the ukulele, right? The, from low to high would be C, E, G, A, right? I could think of that as a basic C6 chord, right? Or, you know, but I could also look at that as like a F major 9 chord, depending on what the low register is mm -hmm. playing, right? It could be a D minor 11 chord. I mean, there's so many different extensions. I mean, it could be a B flat, you know, with a sharp 11, right? So, I mean, you know, there, there's just so many ways that you can just look at those four tones. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's, what I, that's another thing I love about the ukulele, that sometimes when you bring in the low notes or the lower tones, it defines it mm -hmm. too much. And then I think there's less room for interpretation, right? Um, you, you know, speaking of, of, of brain capacity, a few years back, you know, touring all the time and, and, and you know, playing your albums, all the songs, but you had to dedicate a huge chunk of your time to uh, perform and create Baron Yasui's uh, mm. Concerto for Ukulele that we premiered with the Hawaii Symphony. And it's, I, I, I'm, I think I'm, I'm not wrong in saying that it's kind of a, a, a genre that you weren't quite performing before that. So you sort of have to shift gears and not just like three weeks before, but from the time that Baron 
maybe created the concerto one. And, and I, what I remember vividly is, is you know, it was a, a massive piece, and so we premiered that piece, uh, and the crowd was so appreciative, and I could feel all the emotional and physical energy that you had to put into that work that when we finished perform, performing that concerto, you just, you know, you, you burst into tears because I think the, all this whole emotional release mm -hmm. of all this effort and energy that you put in, into that creation and, and then that you, you did it and we did it, the symphony, and Joanne Falara conducted it and, and just like a, a catharsis, it felt like. Tell us about your, your experience. That was just by, you know, as far as anything that I've, I felt like I've ever accomplished, you know, in, in my, my life, outside, outside of family and things like that. I mean, that, that was truly what I feel is my, my greatest accomplishment and what I feel most proud of, you know, that I've ever done, you know, uh, hands down, musically. Um, you know, Dr. Yasui's piece was, um, was, uh, was very atonal. And that, that um, the, the, the things that were coming, <laughs> you know, what I was, the sounds Speaking that was coming out of my, <laughs> yeah, the sounds that were coming out of my ukulele were so foreign to me because I had never played those combinations, you know, those combinations before. So hearing this, it, was, it felt like I was hearing the ukulele for the first time again because I was playing things that I had never ever played before you know um, and and I got to send a big you know I, I have to acknowledge um, the Masaki School of Music right. you know because um, you know Nancy basically um, Nancy Masaki yeah Nancy Masaki basically uh, allowed one of her, her top her you know top instructors Brett Nita to work with me for three months to ser to serve as my music coach, you know, for this project. So Brent was playing the orchestra line. Right? Yeah, yeah. On the piano. And we met Monday through Friday, every day from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. We met over at the studio and and worked worked on the piece. Um, and and then I mean not not straight through because you know I, I would leave for a tour and then come back and then we'd, <laughs> we'd work again and. Like, and uh, you know he was so patient with me, and uh, and he's just you know he he's an amazing musician. I mean, really really incredible. But I um, but he spent so many hours with me, and including Dr. Yasui on the weekends. Dr. Yasui would would come over to my my house and and work with me and and tell me like, ex you know you guys were talking about this a couple weeks ago how that is a an extraordinary opportunity to have the composer sit with you and explain to you like what they were thinking on this during this part or how they wanted how you know how they want it to be executed you know what's the proper phrasing mm -hmm. he could even show me um, I, I could even play things for him and he could tell me which which way he liked it better mm -hmm. you know in this fingering or um, you know there were certain things where I said well what, you know, if something, if like a note were sustaining, rather than just plucking it and let it sustain, like if I did a tremolo, and you know, so we could work out things like that, and he, you know, and I, I felt like I could really perform the piece that, the, the way that, that he wanted, you know, I mean that, and I mean, I don't know if I did, but, you know, but, but it oh, yeah, at yeah. least gave me a good idea, and I didn't have to guess, because I could actually ask him right there. But you know, it was the the greatest experience. You know, being being up on the stage, just a tremendous honor. And and I don't know if I ever got to tell tell this uh, tell this to you, uh, Iggy. But you know, that night, especially the first night, I was so nervous. I mean, my hands were just shaking. I was so nervous. And I remember there was a a, a passage, I think, in the second in the second movement. Um, toward toward the end, where there was a, a a little a little break for me there, and I had to come back in, and I remember I remember getting lost, and I looked at Iggy, 
and Iggy knew, I mean, as soon as he looked at me, he knew I, I you know, he knew I, I kind of got, got a little lost. And he looked at me and he cued me in when to come back in. And I'll just never forget that because, you know, as concert master, it's, it's, you know, part of his job is to understand everybody's part. Right? I mean, he doesn't have my music in front of him, but he knew exactly where I was supposed to come back in. And that, I remember, I remember in that moment being so grateful, but then also once again, like, just realizing like, wow, my, you know, just what an honor it is for me to be up here uh, learning, playing this piece that I spent three months just drilling myself, you know, working in it hours and hours and hours every single day and then playing it with this orchestra who got the music like four days ago. <laughs> and then, you know, we're premiering it together. But it was, um, it was just, it's my greatest memory and, um, and what I'm, I'm, I'm most proud of, you know, in my entire music. Well, it just show how many or how wide your, your palette is. You're able to do so many so many different styles and so many um, touch so many different people. I uh, remember that actually there was a sort of a, a rehearsal with the with brand the pianist at the uh, Masaki School of Music and yes. Joanne Falera was yeah. there. And, That's right. and, and by the way, I think I don't remember exactly what you were talking about when, when, when you got lost, but um, all my colleagues are, are very keen. So it was just me. And sometimes I take the credit because sometimes Claire, my step partner, tells me this is where we are. And then so I just relay the message. Um, Dave, do we have a winner yet? I don't think we do, but I want to ask a question that, actually, before we, I ask the question, can you remind our audience what the exact specific question was for the quiz question? So it was 1999, Jake Shimabukuro performed with the Honolulu Symphony when he was part of your group called Pure Heart. And there were a few selections that they did, but there was one specific instrumental number, so there was no singing. And that really um, featured the ukulele as a solo instrument. And if you don't know the title, maybe it was <laughs> so, um, <laughs> With, uh, <laughs> We're going to take these excerpts of Iggy Siggy each week and combine them into a full length so feature So very film. much inspired in the style of a famous B composer. We have a winner. Ah. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wait, did you just hum it in C sharp minor or was that in D minor? <laughs> I don't remember. Uh, our winner is Helen this evening. Oh. Oh. Does Helen have a last name? Thank you, Helen. Oh, Helen Wong. Congratulations. Oh, Congratulations. As in... Is that Randy's? Randy's, no. Randy's Helen? No, 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 no. no. Huh? No, because, because who we're thinking about has kept her maiden name. So it could be. Who knows? Who knows? Well, okay. I hope someone does, because <laughs> otherwise we'll have to drink this bottle of wine. And what is that <laughs> bottle of wine again, Dave? It is Obsidian, uh, a Cabernet Sauvignon from our friends at Hasser Wine. Thank you, Terry. Uh, Thanks, Helen. Uh, Jake, Thank I, I did want to ask you, so we talked a lot about onstage things, you know, your performance. Um, one story I remember, I, you know, we were having dinner and there were a lot of people and a lot of very important people on your team and some fans or maybe your fan club. And, and, and you were there very humble and I think it was a Japanese place and maybe they served shabu shabu or they had noodles and soup and, and you, what you were doing, you were taking everyone's bowl and you were serving the soup and the noodles and serving each guest. And I was just, Chris was with me, and we were both wondering maybe, you know, you have the limelight and everything, and then maybe there's some points where there's a point maybe you just need to be yourself, and 
sometimes when you talk to fans or producers or whoever, it's sometimes hard to be yourself because maybe you have to watch what you say, maybe you're in the public eye, maybe they're recording every word you say, but just the simple ceremonial fact of, 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 of serving simple food to guests allowed you to just be yourself and be able to breathe and, and be authentic, maybe. Mm. So maybe, maybe I'm making a huge fuss of something you probably don't even remember. Mm. But I guess my question is like, when you're off stage and you just want to be yourself and not have, have you know, you have your, your image, uh, but, and you actually are the image. You know, it's not like sometimes we have artists, they're on stage and like, ah! and, then, <laughs> and, then, and then after the stage at home, they're just super quiet. That's not new. You're, you're kind of the same all the time. But I was just wondering about some, something so simple where you can just take a little breath. I don't know. Yeah, I think, I don't know. I, I think there's, there's something really special about, you know, and, and I, I love this about, um, I, I don't think it's unique to Japanese culture, but like in, in Japan, right, after a big event, they always have something called the uchiage. It's called an uchiage. And basically what, what you do is after it's done, you know, everyone will go to a restaurant or, and you basically celebrate everyone's hard work, right? You celebrate everyone's contribution to the success of, of the night. And I, and I love, I just love that because you know, it, you don't always have that opportunity. And sometimes, um, sometimes in, in, in business or in, uh, in certain industries, it can just feel like it's just never ending, right? It's like, okay, we did this, now we're on to the next thing. Oh, yeah, now we're on to the next thing. And it just, and I think sometimes you can, you can, you lose those moments or those opportunities to show your appreciation, you know, or to, to give people the satisfaction and the recognition of, of the work that they did. And that's why I, I've always loved that. So there's two things. There's the uchiage, which is like the, the, the dinner and everyone's ordering drinks and just like, oh, okay, it's all done and we're just celebrating together. You know, people give, give speeches or, you know, they, they say things. And, and um, but then at the end, there's something called an iponjime. And it's a, it's a little, it's a, it's a quick thing where everyone puts their hands like this and they, they clap together after, a, after they say yo, and it's like a yo, and they all clap together. And that unified clap, what it does is it unites everyone. It's in, in, that, in that split second, it reminds everyone how appreciated they are. And okay, we're putting a close to this, we all did a great job, now let's move forward, right? And, and I love that because it gives the feeling of an end mm. to a chapter, you know? And that, that feeling to me is so important because when you feel that there's an end, you feel like, okay, now let's focus on the next thing. Otherwise, the end is, is different for everyone. Mm -hmm right, in, in, the, in the group, right? So like as musicians, we show up to a, to a performance, you know, for us, the beginning is when, when we get there, we sound check and we play, when we're done, we leave, that's the end. The production crew got there five hours before. They're setting up, right, and then when, when the, and they're the last ones to leave. So their end is something completely different, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a nice way, and in Japan, when we have those uchiages, you know, the production crew, even though they're, they're wrapping up and they, they probably come like an hour or two later, you know, we wait mm -hmm. for them. Yeah. So we all end together, you know, and, uh, and I, I love that concept, that idea and just unifying everyone, you know, again, because I think in, it helps for the longevity the, of, of, the, mm -hmm. of the crew and just the... the unification and, and I love that also before the show and I, I noticed some of my colleagues who uh, also in the tango world they we all gather before the show and if you're religious you say a prayer mm. or if not it's just a, a moment to collect yourself and and, and so you can prepare and, and expand all your energy on stage mm -hmm. and you had that moment and maybe with the symphony you know sometimes we don't have 
as much time, and there are like maybe 85 musicians, so it's it's a little harder to <laughs> to <laughs> to uh, cheer together. But yeah. uh, it's beautiful moments too as well. I want to ask a couple of these other questions that we're getting because uh, I'm very curious about them as well. You, you talked about the process of learning that concerto. Um, do you, are you someone with perfect pitch? Can you hear something and then you know hear a popular song and then sit down on on your instrument and and kind of select notes and kind of put that together on the fly like Iggy does with his his pen and paper? No, absolutely not. Yeah, I, I do not have perfect pitch. Um, I can, if if I hear a, a simple melodic phrase, you know, um, then I'll I'll probably be able to to uh, pick up my ukulele and and find find the the notes. If it's a really complicated, you know, melodic phrase, a lot of times it it takes me a while. You know, I'll I'll sit there and and listen to it over and over and really try to try to hone in, you know, on 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 each. On, on on everything and and it's it's and for me too you know like um hearing complex harmonies sometimes you know like voices that get buried you know somewhere in the arrangement you know uh for some people they can hear it so quickly right especially people that are used to uh playing the harmony right to the to the main lines i've always been i my Majority of my life, I've always focused on on the on the main line, right? So, so, um, but in the last, I know, ten, fifteen years, I've kind of tried to make it a point to focus on the on the on the second voice or the third voice, you know, uh, just to just to kind of get um, get my ear trained, you know, to, Listening to, to do that. that. Viola yeah. yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's hard. I mean, it's a real skill. It's something. That you have to uh, you have to spend a lot of time doing, you know, mm -hmm. and it's not one of those things like, oh, it's like if you haven't done it in a while, it's like getting on, you know, not for me anyway. I mean, you have to you have to constantly do it, you yeah. know. It's the same thing with reading music. I'm a horrible sight reader, you know. I'm a horrible sight reader. If you throw a piece of music in front of me right now, I'm like, oh, okay, wait, 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 give, give me some time, okay, <laughs> let me, uh, <laughs> you know, but. But it's it's something you just have to do all the time, yeah. you know, to keep up with it. So, yeah, I definitely um, I definitely don't have the the ear training, you know, to do. I mean, anything with like with what you know. I I, I wish I, I could I could do it what Iggy does. You well, know, we've already talked about this do, at the beginning but, of the show. Sorry, but it's <laughs> you know, but it's it's really um, and and you just you have to. You have to put the time and effort to, and it's it's a commitment. You know, it's a, it's something you got to do daily, and um, and uh, you know, so yeah. So I'm I'm definitely I I know that now being a dad and you know having two two children, it's 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 been harder to put in the same amount of time that I used to, <laughs> you know, into uh, into practice and playing, but. Um, but the on the on the other side is <clears throat> i feel like the 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 depth of expression mm -hmm. has grown tremendously mm -hmm. you know i feel like i've i have more things to express or 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 different things to 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 say or how i want to say them or how to how to feel them come out of my instrument you know mm -hmm. and so that's been a real beautiful thing that i've grown to love before I ask uh, another question, uh, could you share the correct answer to the quiz? <laughs> oh yeah, we never. <laughs> Only Helen knows. Yes. <laughs> Only Helen knows it. <laughs> so uh, so it was um, it was it's it's a piece called Tokata, and it was a it was a basically a variation on on Bach's uh, Tokata and Fugue in D minor. Yeah. And it so. was very impressive. With so much velocity. Oh, oh, thank you. But yeah, it's um, but I, I, yeah, but I, I, I never, uh, but we didn't, we didn't play the, the intro and all that, right? It was just the, 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 um, I guess what I, what I the meat. called the main, the main <laughs> line, the da 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 da, right? <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that was, uh, you know, what inspired me to, to do that on the ukulele was many years ago. I mean, I've always been familiar with the piece, right? You know, because you you hear it in movies and 
And, um, you know, it's such an iconic sound. You hear it like in those uh, Dracula movies. It's like, right? Da 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 right? But um, what, what, and, and this was another uh, turning point in, in the way I, I listen to music and approach music was because I've always had, um, I've always had a, uh, an appreciation, right, for all different genres of music. But I remember, gosh, was it the 90s? It was, was it early 90s or late 80s? But there was a, a young musician by the name of Vanessa May uh -huh. who, who came out and she was kind of regarded as like a crossover, mm -hmm. right, classical musician into kind of pop or early, you know, EDM, electronic dance music yeah. kind of thing. And, and that was one of the pieces that, that she played. And I remember seeing her with her electric violin and, you know, there was an electric guitar player and, a, um, you know, a drummer. And, you know, it was just, it was like a, it was like a rock concert. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I remember seeing that and I was thinking like, wow, that's, that's kind of neat that she, you know, had this vision to kind of bring in these different elements that you don't necessarily hear in classical music, right? And, and that's when, uh, I think that's for me with the ukulele, I started experimenting with electric bass players and drummers, you know, and things like that and kind of uh, made me realize that, okay, you know, let's, let's you know, try to, try to branch, you know, branch out with different things and experiment. And it was a great learning experience, you know, and so, yeah, I always, I mean, people like Noel Okimoto, who was always one of my heroes. When I was in high school, I played uh, drums in, in the marching band, and I also played drums in, uh, in the jazz ensemble. I was the worst, worst <laughs> jazz drummer, but, you know, Noel Okimoto was, um, was always one of my heroes, right? And then so fast forward, you know, like a decade later and actually being able to share the stage with him and, Play with him. We've done things together with Noel too. Yeah. So, yeah. So speaking of vision and the next decade, uh, a question that I, I like to ask and to put people on the spot: What does the future look like for the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra for symphonic music, uh, especially here in Hawaii? Man, you know, I I don't I don't think I I know enough um, of like the you know just the behind the scenes of what's happening. Um, with everything, but I would love to see it just thrive. I would love to be able to come out and see you guys play every weekend. I would love more opportunities to, to see you, um, not, not just in halls, but, you know, but um, in other places all, all over Hawaii. I would love to see the um, Hawaii Symphony Orchestra tour and play in Japan and represent us in, in you know, in other countries. Mm -hmm. I would love to, um, to have, to have, uh, I don't know, just um, maybe more opportunities for, for, uh, for there to be like chamber ensembles, you know, to go out and, and, and play more. Um, would love to see more collaboration with uh, HYS too. Absolutely, you know, I was Hawaii hoping you were going to get to that. Yes, yeah. absolutely. You know, I think there's uh, this. I mean, I know and you. You're you've on, always you're very, been. You're on the board of the Hawaii. Yeah, Union. you know, I, I feel very, um, very fortunate. I mean, you and, know, Randy Wong. Know you've, yes, uh, they're you've, you've in, opened many, many outlets and, and schools and uh, 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 new dialogues for the for the, the youth uh, orchestra. So we thank you very much. Well, um, thank you. Um, before we leave, I just, you have your latest CD called Trio. Is that uh, your latest uh, CD that is available? Yeah, it's, just it's the latest, but it was released in 2019. So it's kind of a, like, <laughs> it's, um, it's been a while. But I've, um, yeah, you know, I think that's, especially during this time, I mean, I've, you know, I'm not traveling. And I used to travel quite a lot, right, for the last you know, 20 plus years now. So, um, but spending time at home, it's interesting because, you know, you, you have to be creative and you find other ways of doing things like what you guys are doing. And, um, and I, I found that <clears throat> this has been, um, there's been a lot of opportunity right now for collaborative projects, which is great. I mean, even like, uh, and, and not just with other musicians, but other industries. Mm -hmm. 
to mm -hmm. collaborate and support each other. Uh, and I've, I've been seeing a, a lot of that, and I think it's inspiring, and I, I hope those collaborations and those, um, that creativity and that support you know, for each other's uh, industry continues you know, even long after this, um, this virus. Well, you know. uh, Jake, Dave, and Greg, it's a good time to collaborate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the funny thing I, I find is that you had a tune that was before the pandemic that uh, was called that is called the When the Mask Come Down, and that was written before the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, we wrote that song in, I want to say, like the end of 2018, you know, or the beginning of 2019. And at the time, you know, we were talking about it, and, and it didn't, we were like, yeah, it doesn't, I don't know why we even called the song that, you know, but it's the opening track on the record, and we just thought, oh, it'd be kind of cool. And I remember thinking that it was um, the idea was uh, was when when the masks come down. The thought for me was like when you're in an airplane and there's turbulence or there's something, and the mm. the oxygen masks from the top right come down. And uh, and for so for me it was kind of like when you're when you're um, you know, when, when you're going through something, you know, uh, like a difficult time, uh, maybe a lot of obstacles in, in, your, in, in your way, you know, or in your life, um, you know, then there's, there's, there's always that, that support, you know, remember to, remember to, to breathe, remember to, you know, I mean, that, that was kind of my thinking with it. And then it was, yeah, I mean, I remember in the beginning of the pandemic, we were, I was talking about it with my bandmates, you know, Nolan and Dave, who recorded that with me. You know, we wrote it together, and we just thought, like, oh my goodness, you know, we never would have thought. Yeah, I mean, there, there's been a lot of song titles on that record that, at the time, you know, it just felt like okay, it was there, but it didn't really make sense. We have a song on there called Resistance. You know, we have a song on there called. Um, strong in the broken places you know like th like things like that it was an Ernest Hemingway quote um, but yeah. it's yeah it's just it's just uh, but but anyways you know to make a long story short I, I think this is a great time to um, not just collaborate but also you know support the organizations that are meaningful to you you know and, and it, uh, um, in, 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 in any way that you can I know I know, I know we all can't give, uh, you know, um, I mean, some are more fortunate than others, but, you know, we have to, um, we have to show, like, places like the Hawaii Theater, you know, how much we support them and how much we want them to still be here, right, when this is all done. And, and you know, and they're being very creative, right, with the way that they're, they're doing things and, and continuing to support local musicians and uh, and you know I mean that's that's always been a, a long time collaboration and partnership that I've I've always felt you know venues and and artists right that how we we can't serve you know we we need each other because right we we need a, a place that that allows us to it's, it's like it's like watching. It's like watching the Super Bowl on a on a you know eighty five <laughs> you know inch TV. You know, I mean, it's it's such a different uh, experience, you know, versus just seeing it uh, seeing it you know in a in a small little um, you know I I don't know just in my bedroom. <laughs> you know, it's like completely different. And 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 as 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 every musician knows, you know the the, the venue and the characteristics. Of, of the hall and the room is part of the instrument. It's part of the song, it's part of the, the, the music, it becomes the expression, it, it influences how, how and when you play the next note, right? So, you know, we have to, we, we, you know, we, this, we have to com continue to support, you know, yeah. Well spoken. Very well spoken, and you, you saved me from doing my normal pitch at the end of the show about how important it is to sustain not only the Hawaii Theater Center here, but the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra and the Hawaii Youth Symphony and all of these organizations that 
employ musicians and create work for this community and stimulate this economy as we, we get back to normal uh, in the coming months here, hopefully. Um, but, uh, you know, the other thing that really that impacts performances are, are people on the other side. And, and we appreciate you on the other side of the camera here this evening joining us for this. Uh, we appreciate this opportunity to create community with you and uh, enjoy taking your questions and engaging in conversation together. And I just want to thank you, Jake, for taking the time out of your schedule to come over here and, and hang out with us at the theater and talk about the past and the future and uh, definitely the present. I think the most uh, questions we got were regarding when you'd next be performing with the HSO. So mm. might, I, oh, might, might, have to, might have to give them an answer sometime soon. <laughs> yeah. So Iggy, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank yeah. you, Jake. Thank you, Jake. Oh, thank you. Oh, it was such an honor. Thank you. And thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next Tuesday with another special guest. I'm not sure what international holiday it is next Tuesday. We'll have to <laughs> check that out. Uh, but thanks for celebrating with us today, and we'll see you next week. Thanks again for your support. Aloha.